We have now the last section of the day. Um, I'm very glad to invite Yesha Adav, who's going to present a paper on insider trading in complex markets. Yesha is a professor at Vanderbilt Law School. And then we will have the presentation of Mariana Parjandler, who is a professor at Fundação Getúlio Vargas Law School, has got her JSD at Yale Law School and at the Brazilian um, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come here. This is uh, an absolute honor to have the opportunity to present here with you today. My very uh, sincere thanks to Erica and to the FGV for organizing this terrific conference. It's a wonderful, exciting city and an incredible law school to boot. So it's a great privilege to be here. Okay, so my paper is all about insider trading in the information age. So what is this paper, uh, in the broader sense, really seeking to deal with? Uh, this, the sort of the basic uh, question uh, that this paper really seeks to ask, the sort of basic uh, overarching theme of this paper, is how we regulate innovation in the information age. Are all the sort of paradigms that we're used to in sort of tackling securities fraud, corporate governance we've talked about, monetary reform, all those sort of tried and tested paradigms that we're used to dealing with all the way through uh, in our academy, do these still work in this incredible age of financial technology and innovation that we're in today? So my focus in this paper is really looking at insider trading, that sort of offense that a lot of you will be familiar with, and applying that to this sort of really weird and quirky market for credit derivatives. We'll talk about that market shortly, but before we get to that, let's think a little bit about why insider trading. Now, it's not just because I find insider trading exciting. That probably came out wrong. I don't do insider trading. Uh, <laughs> No I, no, I don't do insider trading. Uh, OK, I promise. Uh, but insider trading is really big news. Right? Insider trading is hot off the press. Uh, and almost every single day, we are seeing a sort of new news item come in that sort of reflects the growing importance of uh, this particular offense in the securities and financial markets. So you all uh, probably know who these guys are, right? They're not football players, unfortunately. But here on the right, we have uh, Raj Rajratnam, who was the uh, sort of founder of the Galleon Group, a big, big hedge fund. And the insider trading probe in this case led to the conviction of 50 people and counting uh, in, the, in the US. Here we have Steve Cohen, the founder of SSC Capital, a huge hedge fund in the States, and again, part of a really thick insider trading probe in the, in, the, in the US. And already, they have paid out a $650 million, uh, million dollar fine to the SEC. And more is to come, I'm sure. Now, this is not just a US issue, right? You might think this is all about the US, but it's not. This is a global issue. Just yesterday, um, sort of talking about relevance for the Brazilian markets, uh, the SEC froze the account of Swiss traders uh, following 3G Capital Partners, and uh, which is, involves a lot of sort of Brazilian investors, and Warren Buffett's announcement that they were going to take over the Heinz Company, which is responsible, as I'm sure you know, for producing tomato ketchup and mustard and mayo and all sorts of horrible condiments. Uh, okay, so insider trading. Now, the uh, sort of big picture uh, point, otherwise I wouldn't have a paper, uh, is that our current paradigms for regulating uh, insider trading, our current paradigms for re regulating securities fraud, just don't do the job in the face of. Uh, in the face of the evolving derivatives market. The, deri the derivatives market and the way it works is really problematizing the way that insider trading works. And in fact, our laws are just not working against this particular offense. In addition to sort of looking at 
the problematizing of these laws, we're also seeing a problematizing of the jurisprudence, right? It's also uh, sort of making, um, uh, sort of placing into, uh, into a question the sort of jurisprudential uh, notions that we've taken for granted, the debates that we've had as to the pros and the cons of insider trading in the academy. And we'll talk more about that as the talk progresses. So let's think a little bit first. I'm going to skip a little bit between the slides. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how insider trading works in the US. Now in the US, insider trading is regulated under the all-encompassing uh, all Rule 10b-5. So Rule 10b-5 is basically the shampoo and conditioner, all-you-can-eat, full-service buffet for prosecuting securities fraud. Right? It covers normal misrepresentation, but a big part of that is also looking at insider trading. Now, there are several ways, there are three basic ways in which you can be held liable for insider trading. The first is a sort of very classical way in which if you are an insider of a company that owes the shareholders some form of fiduciary duty and you trade with those shareholders having insider information, then you can become liable. That's our sort of very classic scenario that many of you are familiar with, that if you are a sort of director or an officer with insider information, you trade, that can make you liable. But in the US, we have two more bases on which we can be held liable. The first is the misappropriation theory. And that is really where you have a fiduciary duty to the source of an information, right? And that covers people like us. Right? That covers lawyers, that covers accountants, that covers all of us that come into confidential information as part of our jobs. And if we use that to trade, that's like theft. And that constitutes a ground for us becoming liable under insider trading grounds. Now part of that misappropriation theory, number three, we have, uh, we have trading when you breach some duty of confidence. Right? So if I agree with you to keep something secret between us, and I use that information to trade, that can make me liable as well under US law. Right? So we have several bases against which we can be held liable. But the overarching fundamental basis is that the law does not like people that have confidential insider information as part of their jobs. And using that advantage, they trade with uninformed counterparties. The law does not like you to enjoy that kind of advantage and punishes it, uh, punishes it uh, in, in under Rule 10b-5. <coughs> now, insider trading um, is, uh, for sort of more theoretically speaking, a complex topic. Now, scholars in the US have had numerous debates, and this might surprise you, talking about the fact that insider trading should be legal, right? Not everyone thinks that insider trading is a bad thing, right? A number of scholars in the US say that, in fact, insider trading should be legalized. Why? Because it brings in all sorts of information into the public domain. And doing that, you can encourage market efficiency, you can improve volatility, uh, you can have price efficiency in the market, and therefore we can have a sort of more robust and more efficient marketplace for securities uh, overall. In addition, scholars say that, look, this information is the property of the company that has it. And the company should be allowed to give over this information to whom it pleases for value. For example, to compensate managers or compensate investment analysts that are sort of looking at this company and analyzing it and to incentivize them to do a good job. So the, 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 the academy is really not all in one place, right? They are sort of arguing and they've traditionally argued about insider trading being legalized for the reasons that we've just discussed. Now, interestingly, uh, insider trading law has traditionally never applied to the derivatives market, the over-the-counter der derivatives market, right? Insider trading has, uh, has uh, not applied, Rule 10b-5 has not applied to these incredibly complex uh, derivative securities that have really come into their own uh, in the last sort of 10, uh, 10 20 years. 
So what's got me interested in this topic is the fact that Rule 10 b 5 now applies to this market for a product called a credit default swap under the Dodd-Frank legislation. All right, so before we get further, let's talk a little bit about what a CDS, in fact, is. All right, so many of you have heard of credit default swaps. It's just a quick sort of overview of how this works. So a credit default swap basically trades the credit risk of an underlying debt obligation like a loan or a bond, right? So we have this debt obligation here, and the credit default swap basically allows the lender here to, to buy credit protection, to buy insurance on this debt from another firm. So this other firm promises this lender that it will protect uh, the lender in the event that the company defaults. And through this instrument, through this swap, the lender has essentially traded away the economic risk of the loan to another party. That is basically the credit default swap market. It's, it's actually much more simple than the papers would have you believe. Now, the CDS market, um, as many of you know, has grown incredibly since 2001. Right? It has grown from a teeny tiny market of just 0 0.7 trillion, that's still a lot of money, but it's not a huge amount of money, since $0.7 trillion in 2001 to $62 trillion at the height of the bubble. Now the market's approximately 36 to 40 uh, trillion at a notional value. But the point here is it's a really popular instrument, right? Now, uh, for, for, for most of us, Having seen the coverage in the financial crisis, we would think that CDSs are only traded on mortgage-backed securities, those toxic instruments that brought the whole world collapsing to pieces. But in fact, the majority of CDSs, two-thirds of CDSs, are traded on the debt of a single company or a, or a single company or a country. Two-thirds of CDSs are traded on the debt of just one single entity, and that can be a company as it usually is, or otherwise a sovereign such as Brazil, or such as uh, the US or whatever. Uh, now normally CDSs have been traded in a very opaque marketplace. We have not really seen what's been going on between the counterparties, and therefore there's been a lack of transparency in this market that's not really allowed us to get, our, get a sense of how regulation should be to tackle the challenges that it poses. Now what my paper really argues is that insider trading laws just don't work when they face uh, the sort of challenge of the credit derivative instrument. In fact, what the paper says is that look, functionally, banks are, when they hedge, banks are basically committing insider trading as a matter of course. Right? Banks are coming into, uh, coming into possession of a huge amount of confidential information on their borrower. Right? When you get a loan, you provide your bank with a ton of information. I know Bruno said you have to be a lunatic to, to do that or, uh, or something to that effect. But normally when you're trading with the bank, you have to provide a lot of information. And if the bank uh, sort of buys a swap on that basis buys a security on that basis, then essentially it is committing some form of insider trading. Now, the, uh, the normal sort of route that we would sort of uh, use legally to get there is under the sort of misappropriation arm. Uh, for example, the bank sort of using information fraud in the source theory of misappropriation or the bank basically using confidential information to trade uh, the swaps in, in the market. Now, uh, interestingly, banks can buy protection on $100 of debt that they actually have. But the CDS market is much more fun than that. Right? The, the, the CDS market allows the bank to buy protection on not just its actual exposure, but on a whole lot more exposure should it choose to do so. Right? So if the bank thinks that this borrower is really going to go bust, it can buy a ton more exposure and get paid back as a result. That is the more speculative side of CDS that has really come into being uh, sort of disreputable in the wake of the crisis. 
Right, but we can see that as a legal matter, uh, we, we can sort of discuss this, there are numerous ways to argue that as a matter of course, when banks are hedging, they are committing insider trading as a matter of course. And if this market is to exist, we have to look again at the laws that we're applying to this particular market. Now, in a functional sense, finance scholars have known all along that insider trading is a big part of the CDS market, right? So finance scholars have long said that, look, insider trading is a big part of this market, and we know this. Why? Because the CDS market predicts information uh, in events long before these happen, right? The CDS market is something of a psychic. Right? It's something of a psychic, two years, six months, three months, four months. It predicts the events that will happen, showing them up in the price of uh, sort of trading CDS instruments long before the events actually come to pass. Now, the paper has numerous examples in this case. We've seen, uh, we've seen the Enron, the WorldCom World bankruptcies that were reflected many months before these actually happened. GM, Ford in 2005. And there are numerous recent cases where the CDS market was far, far more predicting uh, than sort of equities or bonds that something was going to go wrong with respect to a company. And so finance scholars say that, look, as a functional matter, this only happens when insiders are actively trading in the market and their information is being brought to bear in the trading space. Now, more interestingly, this a sort of challenge to insider trading law challenges not just the law itself, but also challenges many of the, the sort of uh, theoretical conceptions that we have held true regarding the way that insider trading works, right? So we talked earlier that classical insider trading seeks to protect our shareholders, right? Classical insider trading seeks to protect those poor, vulnerable shareholders that are being uh, disadvantaged when insiders are trading against them. But in the CDS market, are corporate shareholders necessarily losing? Right, so one argument that the paper makes is that uh, corporate shareholders, in fact, might quite like having uh, credit default swaps trading on, uh, on their debt. They might quite like, ha like, like having, oh, five minutes left, uh, they might actually like to have uh, CDS trading on their debt because it allows the company to take on more debt and thereby allow shareholders to profit from the upside. In addition, we have, the, uh, we have the, uh, the sort of efficiency factor. Now, we talked about the fact that scholars are saying that, look, let's legalize insider trading and makes the market more efficient. Well, here we have a control experiment, right? The CDS market is, by definition, allowing this insider information to percolate in. Is the market becoming more efficient? Question mark. Now, the studies have argued that this efficiency is actually just very one-sided. The CDS market behaves a lot like a stroppy teenager, right? It only looks at negative news, right? You tell a teenager that they're looking really nice, they'll say, yeah, whatever. But if you tell them that their hair is long or whatever, they'll go into a big, big sort of mood about it. And this is exactly how we have what we have in the CDS market. It's very sensitive, very efficient vis-a-vis -vis negative news. It's not so good at reflecting positive news. So if you do want to sort of bring in a positive perception to the market, you have to pay more to do that. Buy equities, make changes, whatever. You have to work harder to make that positive news valuable with respect to CDS trading. So we may have something of an issue here. Now I'll try to move along. Now, in, with respect to sort of looking at the potential for abuse, lenders have an incredible position to, to sort of highlight the value of the signaling, the efficiency that the CDS market can, can, can bring to bear. Now, if lenders buy a lot more protection, the use of that information is all the more powerful, right? Lenders who have bought protection have an incentive to see the company fail. They might sort of get repaid as a result. Therefore, if they sort of buy up more protection, that signaling can be powerful and, in fact, make it harder for the company to come back from a potential loss. So we can see parts of why CDS trading, insider trading in CDS can have a disruptive effect, 
particularly where lenders are behaving opportunistically, uh, speculatively, to sort of uh, signal negative news with respect to a company based on the insider information that they have. Now, what the paper seeks to argue is that, look, you know, we need to abandon Rule 10b-5 with respect to CDS rating, right? We need to think outside the box and do something new. And in short, the paper sort of puts forward a, new, a sort of new paradigm to regulate, uh, in particular, CDS trading, but perhaps thinking more broadly, to look at market disruption. You know, uh, um, instances where the securities trading of a, of, of a company is disrupted as a proxy for uh, the potential for some form of insider abuse under t uh, being taking place uh, within a company. So this, uh, so the, uh, the the sort of paper uh, sort of seeks to uh, seeks to encourage regulators to refocus their gaze on something more tangible, more visible, less costly to sort of uh, to sort of. Um, uh, investigate and really look to market disruption as a way to understand when people are behaving badly and when lenders should then be disciplined vis-a-vis uh, -vis their actions against a company. In addition, we may seek to bring in stronger lender liability rules, fiduciary rules that make lenders liable much more strongly than they have been for sort of bad actions they take vis-a-vis -vis their borrowers. Again, to make sure that shareholders have the power that they need when dealing with powerful lenders that are supplying them credit. But still, even though we're sort of dealing with this new paradigm, we still have a number of questions to explore. Right, so the paper sort of seeks to close with uh, certain questions, mainly the fact that what happens when insider trading is being practiced as a matter of course by a segment of the financial market? If one type of actor can do it, what about the rest of them? Right? What is the place for the rest of them? Can they also justify insider trading with respect to uh, their activities when they know that banks are doing it every day in the CDS market? In particular, what happens to notions of confidentiality? When banks are trading on the back of their insider news, when do, how do we sort of reevaluate confidentiality for the purposes of the bank lender relationship and also for sort of understanding when information is becoming public in the securities market? So these are just some of the big picture questions that the paper seeks to raise, but again, doesn't answer, so at least I can have another paper to write in, uh, in some years' time. But uh, thank you so much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward uh, to your comments. So thank you so much. Um, so, so we are presenting a paper on the evolution of shareholder voting rights. Uh, I must say, um, this paper uh, looks a little bit like an outlier. I found out a little bit late in the process that the conference was entitled Post-Crisis Development. So, so I was very grateful uh, to Erica to schedule this paper for the last one. So, so hopefully uh, some people wouldn't, wouldn't really notice. Uh, this feature. So it's basically a historical paper, and and I and, and I hope you um, and I hope you find it interesting nonetheless. So it's a historical paper that deals mainly with uh, voting rules in the 19th century, and I start by noting um, Adam Smith's uh, very famous critique of of corporations uh, in the Wealth of Nations. He uh, didn't like corporations very much, curiously, and he didn't like them for basically two reasons. One is the reason which we now call uh, agency costs, that is, the risks that managers might um, manage the firm uh, uh, considering their own interests and other interests of investors. And the second, um, what I hear called monopoly, but, but basically uh, notions of market power. At the time, uh, corporations entailed privileges, and, and many of them indeed had market power. So basically, modern corporate law really focuses on the first of these issues, really focuses on agency costs. And also, economic historians, when they look back um, to the 19th century or earlier periods, very often they look back with the agency cost focus in mind. And, and what I really want to suggest in this paper is that this might be a little bit anachronistic, that the second, that the second concern was very much a prevalent concern in the evolution of corporate law, and that concerns really about market power shaped very important corporate governance responses, both in terms of the ownership structure of corporations and in terms of their voting rules. Uh, so, so, so I'll be talking here about shareholder voting rights. Um, today we are used to thinking 
uh, as a rule, <laughs> we, we know that depending on, on the market, what standard really changes. But as a general rule, we think that the standard is really a rule of proportional voting, one share, one vote. Um, we also have, we also see every once in a while, um, uh, what I hear called progressive voting, multi-voting stock. We saw that in the morning that this type of arrangement is becoming more common in, in recent US uh, IPOs, but but still not not as common. I think it raised up to 13% in recent IPOs. And we have a third type of voting rule, which is uh, what we call here regressive voting rules, or, or really just voting caps. This is the type of rule that uh, instead of giving uh, voting rights in direct proportion to, to share ownership, or instead of favoring large shareholders over small shareholders, this type of voting rule really favors small shareholders over large shareholders. So the most simple type of rule is a rule that caps the amount of votes that a, a shareholder um, can cast at say 10 votes per shareholder or 1% of total capital. And, and these types uh, of rules, they still exist today. They're usually understood as anti-takeover devices, but they are somewhat rare. But they were incredibly prevalent in the 19th century, pretty much everywhere. Now we have studies in a very large number of countries and we found voting caps in the corporate charters of so many corporations at that time. So there's a puzzle. I mean, they have disappeared but they were incredibly common then. So the question is, uh, why? And we have, some, we have some theories out there in the literature. Uh, perhaps uh, Colleen Dunlavy, she's an economic historian. She uh, was the first to, to undertake uh, and popularize this type of study. And, and she, she argued that uh, those rules were, were a result of a social conception for uh, democratic governance. The one share, one vote rule being plutocratic because it gives more uh, power to large shareholders and regressive voting rules being more democratic, closer to the one member, one vote rule. And then more recently, we had a number of works by economic historians suggesting that the reasons for those rules were not uh, ideological, but really economic in nature, and they were basically a form of shareholder protection at a time where institutions were not as developed uh, so as to provide formal legal protection to, to minority shareholders. So here I cite Eric Hilt, he studied those rules. They said they were designed to attract the participation of small shareholders by offering them protection from dominance by large shareholders. Also Aldo Musacchio, he, he is also an economic historian. He has uh, studied this phenomenon in Brazil and he concluded that this, uh, the voting caps were the most important protection offered to early 19th century small investors. Um, but these existing theories, uh, in our view, and I don't know if I mentioned, but this is joint work uh, with Henry Hansman of Yale, uh, these uh, two theories, they don't explain two important features. First, they don't explain the variation across industries, so this type of voting caps are very common in transportation companies, turnpikes, canals, sometimes bridges, um, also in insurance companies, banks, but they were very uncommon in manufacturing firms, so we have an industry variation that goes unexplained. And also, we don't know why then they disappeared, because if anything, societies became more democratic uh, as time went by, and also as, um, uh, uh, as time went by, investor protection were, was arguably even more needed. So why did these um, clauses uh, eventually disappear? So we really, we propose a different explanation. We suggest that those voting rules served as a form of consumer protection, not really investor protection. Uh, so what do we really mean by that? We mean that many of the firms that had those voting rules were effectively local monopolies. And they had a very interesting characteristic in terms of their ownership structure to the effect that, that very often they were local mono monopolies that provided essential services to merchants and that these merchants were very often the principal shareholders of those firms. So basically many of these early corporations that we see, we tend to see them as investor-owned firms, but very often they were not. They were very much closer to what we see, what we would uh, call now uh, consumer cooperatives. And why do, do, did these firms 
wanted to have voting caps? Well, they feared dominance of the firm by an investor who would then charge their merchant customers monopoly prices. So they were basically a, t a type of anti-takeover device that was used by the merchant owners to protect themselves from a takeover from a possible, uh, from a possible um, investor interested in charging them monopoly prices. And the idea is that voting restrictions provided some protection, even though not absolute protection. Um, so basically, we address this point by looking at a number of contexts. Uh, I'll focus here. This paper focuses on the US experience. We also mentioned briefly um, the very early corporations, the Dutch and e English East India companies, uh, the experience in England, the experience in France, and the experience in Brazil. Today, I'll focus only, for, for, for uh, given our time constraints, on the U early US experience and also on the Brazilian experience for which we gathered um, a significant new data based on primary sources. So, so what were those firms really like? So really, turnpikes are a wonderful example. Uh, turnpikes means roads, really, uh, roads for which you pay, you pay a toll. Um, so they were really the most common type of business corporation in the late 18th century and early 19th century. And they had the highest incidence of voting caps. Basically, the vast majority here have, um, in this study by Eric Hilt, he finds that 98% of turnpikes in New York had voting caps. And then who were the shareholders in these turnpikes? Well, very famously, they were adjacent merchants and landowners that needed a road, needed a road wide to do commerce, to, to transport their production. Uh, they were, uh, it's very interesting because those turnpikes uh, very often were unprofitable. That wasn't a big deal. The reason they invested in, in, in the firm was to get the road uh, close uh, to their land so they, they could make money on the ancillary activity, not to make necessarily a direct profit. And the turnpikes example, because turnpikes were so famously unprofitable, even though they continued um, to be formed, really shows the tension between our consumer protection account and the, the, the usual investor protection account. Uh, from, from, of course, from, a, from the perspective of a potential investor, those consumers were essentially self-dealing because they were choosing the prices to be low in order to benefit themselves. So they were basically tunneling the firm's potential profits out through lower prices for themselves. And the result is that very little or no um, return was often paid on this turnpike stock. Uh, one question is like, why not a government ownership? We, today we are used to thinking of transportation as a government uh, enterprise. Uh, it's true that in the U.S. this was very difficult in the beginning. Um, it, there was a strong resistance to taxation and, and really public policies were marked by a very strong inter-regional conflict that very often prevented uh, state action and the consequence was this type of donative uh, contribution to fund what was essentially a public good, which was the road. Uh, bridges, sorry, very similar to that of turnpikes. Very often, they, uh, they were obviously monopolies for, for obvious reasons, and a fair number of bridges also were owned by their customers, also had voting restrictions. So canals too, um, the, f especially for the very early canals, the very early canals were very short, so they, they were able to have a homogeneous shareholder base that could organize and form a firm, and very often they had voting caps. It's true that to the extent that you started needing a longer canals, consumer ownership uh, tended to not to become feasible in due to the heterogeneity of the potential shareholders. And very famously, the government took over. Uh, an example is a very famous Erie Canal uh, of the 19th century. Um, and this is quite curious because early railroads were also like canals. Um, we are used to thinking of railroads as the darlings of Wall Street uh, in the 19th century. Everything interesting and exciting that happened in the 19th century very often involved railroads and contests for railroads. You have the robber baron stories about railroads. But the very early railroads were very similar to those types of consumer cooperatives. They were very short. 
The reason, who are their shareholders? Well, again, adjacent merchants and landowners. And the reason they invested in the railroad is that they could have a road close to them so they could have some uh, reasonably cheap transportation for their production. And guess what? These early railroads, short railroads, consumer-owned railroads, very often had voting caps. Of course, this model of short railroads soon became outdated, and then the longer railroads came to be investor-owned, and not surprisingly for our theory, they uh, then very quickly shifted to a model of one share, one vote. Uh, voting uh, caps soon became unpopular among uh, railroads. We see that also with respect to banks. Also, early banks in the US were very often very similar to credit cooperatives. Very often, people became shareholders in the banks, not because they wanted to make a profit, but because they wanted to borrow. So you have some, some interesting quotations of the time saying that bank shareholders, they're not capitalists. They are borrowers. So the reason why you became a shareholder in the bank is because, it's because you wanted access to the bank's credit. Uh, they very often had market power. It was hard to get a bank charter. For some time, there was only one. Um, there was only one bank in each town. And of course, the idea is that you wanted to be a shareholder in the bank to get access to the bank, but you didn't want your competitor, of course, to get control of the bank and then deny you credit. So voting caps uh, really made it difficult for a single shareholder to acquire control uh, of the bank. The same is true, curiously, also for property and, casual and casualty um, insurance. Local merchants were very often um, the main shareholders of these early insurance companies, and very often these early insurance companies had voting caps. Some of them were uh, explicitly formed as mutual companies, but some of them, even though they were formally uh, organized as joint stock corporations, they were still owned by their shareholders and they very often had voting caps. So, oh, it was getting so repetitive, but finally something is different. And that's the, the example uh, of manufacturing. So manufacturing uh, was completely the opposite. Uh, voting caps were extremely rare. They were extremely rare. So compare, we, we mentioned that um, we had 98% um, companies with um, with voting caps uh, in New York. Now, uh, with respect to manufacturing, it's just really the reverse. We had 2% of companies with voting caps and 98% of the companies with a proportional one share, one vote rule. Um, the pioneer uh, statute on general incorporation uh, in New York for manufacturing already provided for a well, one share, one vote rule. And what are the, reason, the possible reasons for that? Well, very often manufacturing firms were in um, uh, competitive markets and, and therefore they were not monopolies that had to be owned by their local merchants. And in many cases, it would be very often they had a very dispersed consumer base, so it would have been very hard in any case for consumers to organize and own the firm. So we have a different type of market structure, also a different type of corporate ownership structure, and a different type, uh, a different type of voting pattern at the time. Um, so Aldo Musacchio, uh, he um, did um, a beautiful study of uh, early corporations in Brazil in the late 18th, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and he found that. Um, uh, very often, Brazilian firms also had voting caps, and he said, well, that explains capital market development in Brazil at the time. That was a substitute for investor protection. So he was a great advocate of the investor protection theory. And then we went on and gathered more evidence. So we basically looked at every single act of incorporation in Brazil between 1850 uh, which is the day, which is the year of the Commercial Code, and 8082, which is the year of the enactment of Brazil's general incorporation law. After that, you no longer needed governmental approval in, uh, in order to incorporate, and our evidence was mixed. So uh, it doesn't really allow us to prove or disprove the consumer protection theory, but it it does provide. Um, some evidence that is quite contrary to the investor protection theory. Uh, so wh what did we find? Well, we, we found that 
voting caps were in, in our sample were increased way more prevalent than um, well, which sample, but it wasn't really a sample. It was with that period it was basically almost a universe of companies that voting caps were incredibly prevalent. They were almost always. Um, adopted by Brazilian char by, by charters in Brazil. Only 5% of the firms uh, had a one share, one vote rule. Other than that, you had pretty much voting caps across the board. But we, uh, we also found that those were not contractual in nature by any means. Why? Because we found out that it was the government that very often was imposing those voting caps as a condition to granting, granting incorporation. So, so sometimes we would see uh, the proposed charter with a voting cap and then the charter being approved uh, with a voting cap or a proposed charter with a with a flexible voting cap uh, with a high ceiling of votes per shareholder and then the government here reducing that ceiling in order to approve um, the charter so um, that's inconsistent with the contractual character it seems that the government was imposing the, that clauses it's not very clear why it's also somewhat inconsistent with the consumer protection theory because it, it was imposing that uh, those voting caps in some companies that were in effect consumer cooperatives but it was it was also imposing them on some firms that were uh, evidently um, consumer owned but we, what we do find is that as soon as companies had a real choice uh, very soon after general incorporation, the number of uh, firms having a one share, one vote rule increased dr dramatically. So I here have only seven years after general incorporation, it increased from 2% to 42%, um, and the voting caps remaining were way more flexible than the previous voting caps. And that was precisely the period in which capital markets boomed. So it's inconsistent with the idea that it was voting caps that was really um, increasing the confidence of investors and making them uh, willing to, to invest in, in Brazilian corporations at the time. We also suggest then, uh, finally, that this view, um, this understanding that so many of these early corporations were in essence consumer cooperatives, that they were actually owned by consumers, not by investors, also helps shed light on other um, doctrines or areas of corporate law beyond voting rules. And we want here to suggest that it provides another rationale for the doctrine of ultra-virus. The doctrine of ultra-virus ultra -virus means beyond the powers. It's the idea that the corporation has a very narrow corporate purpose and it cannot deviate from that corporate purpose. And that doctrine declined uh, over time. And we suggest that, it, well, it makes this Ultra-virus rule makes a lot more sense if you think that those companies were, in essence, consumer cooperatives. Of course, if I'm investing in the company, if the company is not going to make a profit, and I'm investing in the company because I want to have access to the road, it's really critical that this company remains a road and does not turn into a manufacturing company. That, that, that's not what I signed up for. And courts understood that at the time. So we have some, we said in the, in, in the paper, some, some uh, uh, lawsuits involving changes of routes of, of turnpikes. So some investors said, well, after, um, um, after the direction of the road has been changed, I no longer want to subscribe because the only reason why I wanted to be a shareholder is that that road was very close to my property. Now it's no longer close to my property. I don't want to be a shareholder anymore. And, and some courts did agree, saying, well, this was the objective, so we can be uh, off the hook. Of course, in cooperatives, a problem we see up to this day is that um, there is a risk that um, if purpose restrictions are not very close, that um, there could be cross-subsidization between heterogeneous shareholders, so purpose restrictions do um, some job in that regard. And, um, and then we come basically to, to the last part um, of the puzzle, which is why they disappeared. We claim that our theory, um, hopefully, is a little bit more convincing about why they disappeared over time. Well, first, of course, the government took over uh, many of these projects, and the government is um, a territorial consumer cooperative, which is also subject to a very regressive voting rule, this type uh, one person, uh, one vote, and that increasingly became the norm. Um, many industries became more competitive, so it was less necessary to have um, shareholders 
own the firm in order to protect themselves. If if, if competition applies, it's it is um, it, it's no it's not bad for for um, a consumer not to be a shareholder because prices uh, will be competitive. Um, and uh, and also, of course, voting caps were. Uh, only a temp afforded only temporary protection. It, there were no transfer restrictions in those companies, so nothing prevented um, these shares from eventually falling in the hands of investors of those firms. And courts, over time, uh, uh, proved to be very unwilling to police um, opportunistic transfer of shares right before the shareholder meeting in, in order to evade um, the voting caps. Another very important point is that um, I mentioned in the beginning that both the issue of market power and agency costs were dealt by corporate law in the beginning, but the second issue increasingly became extraneous, a, a stranger to this area of the law. There, be, there emerged different areas of law, um, basically uh, antitrust and utilities regulation that started addressing um, uh, issues of market power, so a, a corporate response was no longer uh, really necessary. And finally, um, when cooperatives, of course, still exist, but then uh, a big part of the story is a story about a specialization of corporate law um, in, in really in the type of firm that is owned by investors. Today, we still have cooperatives, but they are and they have very regressive voting schemes. The, 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 the most common rule for cooperatives, of, of course, is a one member, one vote rule. But those are overt cooperatives because they can actually be formed under special cooperative statutes. Um, in, in the US, they, the first one was enacted in 1866. Uh, in Brazil, it was not until uh, the early 20th century that this happened. And actually, Brazilian lawyers would be, would be surprised to find out that even the, the requirement that the corporation must be a for-profit enterprise, which today is very explicit in our corporate law, uh, did, not, uh, did not came, um, was not written into the law until 1940. Back in the day, nonprofit enterprises, cooperative enterprises, they were all formed and were operated under general corporate laws. So basically, the conclusion is that um, really, since Burley and Means, we have become used to thinking, well, at least this is a very US specific conclusion, but uh, we, we, we have been used to thinking. Uh, about the late 19th century and early 20th century as the period that ownership was separated from control. But here I want to just really flag that also in that same period we had a different type of separation, which was the separation between uh, investment uh, and consumption. So thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I have, had, I have the amazing honor today of both opening our conference and closing our conference. So uh, uh, since I'm standing between you and dinner, I will try to keep my remarks uh, relatively short. But I do want to have a full response to our speakers. These were really interesting papers, each of them in their own way uh, challenging some conventional wisdom. Uh, so let me uh, also uh, thank our host. Uh, it's, del it's just a delight to be in Sao Paulo. This is my first time here, and uh, FGV has been very gracious at giving us our facilities and feeding us and, and taking good care of us, and we're, we're very happy here. So uh, I look forward to coming back sometime uh, in not too long. So let me comment first about uh, on Professor Yadav's paper on insider trading. Uh, Professor Yadav tackles a very interesting and important question in this paper. Uh, she asks whether traditional approaches to insider trading law can work in an environment where lenders to corporations, lenders who presumably have a substantial amount of access to insider information about the, the, the borrowing company, uh, can then turn around and go into the CDS market to buy credit protection uh, to protect themselves or to hedge their positions that they've taken with that uh, investor uh, with that borrower corporation. Uh, Professor Yadav tells us that the ability of lenders to do this is at the essence of what CDS markets do, okay, and it's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to provide a mechanism by which an investor, in this case the, the lender, uh, can hedge their position uh, and thereby reduce their risk. Uh, the point of CDS markets is to, uh, and, and other derivatives markets is to provide a menu of securities 
that investors can buy and sell to help them hedge the risk of investments that they've taken on. Finance theory tells us that this kind of hedging should enable market participants to move risk around uh, in, in a Kosian fashion so that it ends up in, uh, held by the parties that are best situated uh, to, bear the, to bear the risk. And it is in this sense that CDS are, are normally, or at least the conventional wisdom in finance, is that CDS contribute to aggregate efficiency of financial markets in general because they provide a mechanism for facilitating uh, the uh, allocation of assets, uh, liabilities, and risks, uh, having them each go to the party that can best, uh, best absorb the risk or, or, mo or place the highest value on the assets. Um, now, it seems obvious that this kind of allocation uh, function would provide substantial value to the financial markets. But Professor Yadav points out that when a lender to a specific corporation goes into the markets to buy protection against a default by that same corporation that they've just lo loaned to, they are by definition trading on insider information. In doing so, do such lenders violate insider trading rules? And if so, how should inv enforcement authorities respond? Well, prior to Dodd-Frank, CDS had been, and, and other derivatives, had been explicitly excluded from regulatory oversight, so that even if it was technically illegal for them to be doing some kind of insider trading in that market, there was no regulatory authority uh, that would do anything about enforcing a, pro a prohibition on trading. Uh, Dodd-Frank explicitly changed this. Uh, it extended the rule reach of Rule 10b-5 to credit derivatives trading. Uh, uh, this, of course, creates a great dilemma for, for regulators as well as for scholarly theories about why uh, insider trading should be illegal in the first place. One theory about why insider trading should be illegal is that it constitutes a breach of fiduciary duties of the insider uh, who extracts informational benefits uh, uh, obtained in uh, confidentiality in the course of carrying out their duties with respect to uh, the borrowing corporation. Now, lenders clearly obtain a lot of insider information. Uh, presumably, it's supposed to be kept confidential. Uh, if they act on that information by purchasing protection, is this a breach of such confidence? Well, it, seemed that it would seem that it should be, um, but if the firm cannot purchase, the, the lending firm cannot purchase a CDS uh, to hedge the risks that they've taken on, uh, this would seem to eliminate one of the primary social benefits that are supposed to arise from CDS trading. There's supposed to be a mechanism for hedging. Uh, as a legal matter, do lenders to the corporation have fiduciary obligations to their borrowers? Uh, well, they surely do not have fiduciary obligations to their borrowers at the point at which they're negotiating the terms of the loan. That uh, they're on each side, they're on equal, equal uh, participants, uh, and that they, there's no fiduciary obligation uh, between them. But what if the bargain that they reach uh, between the corporation and the lender explicitly makes it clear that the lender retains the right to buy protection credit and cr pr protection, uh, credit protection in the credit markets? then where's the harm? They agreed that they could do it, and they're doing it. So they're not, they're acting on information, but they were given permission specifically to do that. Well, there's a second theory about the harm that comes from insider information, uh, insider trading, and that's that it gives the insiders an advantage in trading with, with shareholders. And as with the fiduciary duty, uh, fiduciary theory, if one understands that shareholders are the owners of the corporation, then one could argue that shareholders are also the owners of the information that the lenders are trading on, uh, and, that it, and that therefore the, for the lenders to trade would be misappropriation. Uh, Professor Yadav tells us that CDS trading challenges this second theory because borrowers cede their right to control the information. So uh, it, I'm quoting now from the paper, lenders acquire these rights through their access to company books and their close relationship to a, borrow, a borrower uh, and then elsewhere, and the CDS market allows lenders to transact using these rights. Well, this is a very interesting assertion. And I, as a de facto matter, clearly lenders acquire information. But it's not at all clear to me that as a de jure matter, they acquire property rights in the information. 
The property rights they get, I would think, would be a function of the contractual terms, the relationship between the borrower and the lender. Uh, if it is sufficiently valuable to the borrowing firm to insist that the lender not purchase CDS uh, to protect themselves, then the borrower should be willing to pay for that higher, pay a higher interest rate to the lender uh, for that, uh, for the, the lenders agreeing to give up this opportunity to protect themselves. And if it's not sufficiently valuable, then again, where's the harm from lenders trading in the risks associated uh, with the corporate, uh, with the corporate's, uh, corporate debts? So I'll come back to the harm question in a minute. But let me say there's two co concepts of efficiency going on in this paper. Uh, first is the e possibility that CDS trading makes financial markets more efficient in the sense of allocational efficiency. Um, there's also a second sort of efficiency in here, and that's the degree to which prices in financial markets are uh, made by the action of all of the various investors to fully reflect all of the information that's available. Uh, Professor Yadav seems to think that CDS trading improves the informational efficiency of financial markets. That may or may not be true, but the information, uh, information efficiency doesn't necessarily imply allocational efficiency. These are two different things, and, and it, I think it might be helpful in the long run to sort of go through and make sure which one is she talking about at various points uh, in the paper. I th um, but it goes right to the dilemma uh, of insider trading enforcement. If lenders have put up effective Chinese walls between their lending operations and their CDS trading operations so that they're not trading on insider information, then in what sense are they contributing to informational efficiency? So the information is, is the Chinese wall should keep the information from being, uh, from get getting into the market through the trading activities uh, of the lenders. So um, let me talk about the harm. Professor Yadav says that the harm, that one of the kinds of harms that can come from insider trading in CDS markets would be from lenders who buy more protection than their own exposure. Okay, so they go into the market they know ha they may have a piece of infi insider information. They go into the market. They say they have an exposure of $100 million, but they go in and they buy a $1 billion worth of, uh, of credit protection. Okay? This would give them an incentive to use their insider trading and influence to try to trigger a default because they'd make more on the payoffs from the credit default swaps that they'd buy bought than they would lose on the, uh, on the, on the actual underlying debt, uh, which could lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy in which the corporation collapses financially, not so much because it is inherently worth less than, its li than the liabilities it has, uh, but because its lender bet against it, okay, and thereby prevented it from obtaining financing that might have allowed it to get through the financial difficulties that it was in. It seems to me this is clearly an abusive practice uh, and that it, it destroys the allocational efficiency of the CDS market to the extent that it's allowed to happen. Um, so the, 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 this potential for uh, allocational inefficiency from this kind of trading would overwhelm any potential informational benefits that might come from insider trading. Uh, Professor Yadav argues that regulators should try to enforce rules against insider trading. They sh that it, instead of trying to find who knew what when, that they should just focus on market disruptions. Uh, and I like that in theory, but I worry that regulators don't really have any way of knowing which firms collapsed because of inherent difficulties for the firm uh, and which firms collapsed because their lenders bet against them. Okay, um, it seems to me like there's another approach that would make more sense, which is regulators could simply define that the act of a lender by purchasing more credit in the CDS market than the lender's actual exposure would be an abusive or manipulative practice and therefore a per se violation of Rule 10b-5. This would be fairly easy to enforce, I would think, and I think it would go a long way toward preventing the kind of uh, CDS trading that's likely to be harm, harmful to the market. 
Uh, so, but I think that by opening up this question, Professor Yadav has taken us into so, an important new area where we need to be paying attention, uh, where regulation is just beginning to be developed and we need to think through these issues much more carefully than uh, has been done to date, either in the academic literature or, to my knowledge, in the uh, regulatory literature. Uh, now let me say a few more words, of, uh, a few words about uh, uh, Henry Hansman and uh, Ma Mariana Pargendler's paper. Um, I have a keen interest in the history of the corporate form, so I just I really like this paper. It was fun to read, and I think it's inherently interesting. Uh, the paper uh, also has significant relevance, I think, for uh, p anyone interested in corporate governance around the world today. It's not just a historical piece; it's relevant to to the way to we think about corporate governance today. A key idea in this paper is that all corporations are not alike. The corporate form of organization is remarkably versatile uh, and has made uh, possible a wide, arrange, a wide range of arrangements for bringing labor, capital, uh, technology, and management expertise together in a productive way. Now, in the U.S., uh, uh, Professor Pargendler mentioned that in, in Brazil, there are actually separate bodies of law for cooperatives versus regular corporations. Uh, I understand for uh, corporations versus the equivalent of what we in the United States call LLCs, that those are different uh, bodies of law in, 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 in Brazil. And I, at you know, some point, I'd really like to understand more about why that is. In the US, we basically have the same body of law that governs all of those different kinds of, of enterprises. Same body of law governs large corporations and small corporations, publicly traded corporations and closely held corporations, for-profit corporations and not-for-profit corporations, stock corporations and membership corporations, with some, uh, with some minor tweaking at the margin. Okay? Uh, and we've recently developed this LLC, uh, and, and that, that's, a, that's a new development uh, which uh, is primarily, as I understand it, is primarily a, creates a tax benefit that's unavailable in an ordinary corporate form. But other than that, the corporate form is really a versatile, it's a wonderful body of law. It makes possible a lot of different arrangements. Uh, in the last three dec decades, corporate law scholarship has been heavily influenced by a fixation on agency costs uh, that are thought to be endemic in the relationship between outside shareholders and inside managers and directors. But corporations also interact uh, in the world through their relationships with their workers, with their customers, uh, with their d neighbors in communities where they operate, uh, through the governments of the states where they operate, through their suppliers, through th with their lenders. The phrase corporate governance is often taken to refer to um, corporations, to the way corporations structure their relationship with their shareholders. But Professor Yadav just explored some of the issues that arise in the relationship between corporations and their lenders. And Professor Pargendler focuses in this paper on the relationship between corporations and their customers. Uh, she shows how governance arrangements, especially voting rights of shareholders, ca can be useful sometimes in influencing the re relationship between shareholders, uh, management, um, and customers. These relationships in many cases and in special circumstances, and this is the sort of uh, I issue that I think uh, is more likely to arise in developing countries uh, than in, in, the, in, in the U.S. where we have so, so many of our, our financial markets and other markets are now very well developed. Um, in uh, developing countries, there may be many op situations in which uh, these other relationships are extremely important. Um, and it, so I think it's useful for corporate law scholars to explore these other relationships and to be open to the possibility that something else might be going on in the corporate governance uh, arrangements that might that ha may have to do with something other than or in addition to just the relationship between shareholders and managers. Uh, th this is clearly what the Hansman and Pargendler paper does. Let me uh, move on so we can finish here. The basic empirical observation they make is that a significant share of corporations chartered in the U.S. prior to about 1860 had regressive voting rules. Um, Business historians have known this for a long time. Uh, early literature on this uh, have speculated that it was about trying to provide protection for smaller shareholders. Uh, but um, and other, sc other scholars have speculated that it might, it might have been an expression of a cultural value in favor of more democratic structure. Har uh, Hansman and Pargendler offer a different explanation. 
and it's one that strikes me as highly insightful and important. They argue that many early corporations um, were, uh, were really like consumer cooperatives, okay, and that the voting restrictions were designed to make it more difficult for an investor to get control of the company and then use that investor to, uh, to exercise their monopoly power that they had in a way that would hurt the customers of the firm. Uh, and many of the small investors were, in fact, customers of the firm. So um, I'm not sure we can completely exclude the possibility that these arrangements were about protecting the interests of minority shareholders. And there is a, a body of, of, of scholarship coming out of, uh, that, I, that I've recently ran across for, uh, from Professor Eric Hilt. Uh, he takes another look at these uh, sharehold, at the, at the question of share, the structure of shareholder rights in early corporations. And he comes to the conclusion that, that, um, that many of the, these areas, that the particularly in these turnpike companies, where they had these regressive voting rules, the, co the corporate charters also had very specific provisions in them that said how much, what, what the rates were that the, uh, that the turnpike company could charge on its roads, okay? You wouldn't think that they would also need protection on a, uh, by uh, item by item listing of what they could charge the rates on the road if they were being protected by the voting rights uh, or vice versa. Um, what's missing in, in his argument, I think, is the question of could they enforce those rate requirements? Was there an enforcement mechanism in place? And if not, the shareholder, the protection through uh, providing the regressive uh, uh, share voting structure might have also been important. Um, I also think that this, the ideas in this paper are important because we are looking at co contemporary phenomena such as dual class voting shares and some of the things that uh, Professor McCary spoke about this morning. We intend to interpret these things automatically in terms of shareholder primacy and agency costs, but maybe we need a broader lens to look at other things that are going on uh, in the case of uh, the, the dual class shares thing, we've clearly got something going on. It seems to me clear that we have something going on about the parties that bring the ideas to the, to the enterprises needing protection as much as the parties that bring money to the, to the, to the, um, to the business. So with that, I will uh, say thank you again for all that we've, uh, that we've uh, the whole day of, of interesting activities, and I look forward to it. I, I have a small question for the people on the history of cooperation. I think that your argument becomes stronger if you had some data about um, what's the percentage of consumer who were also shareholder. Because if it's many of shareholders were consumer, they could still exploit the other shareholder with monopoly price or with, uh, um, and then, um, but the other way around, I think, is more important. Yeah, uh, we would love to have that data. Uh, the thing is that that data is very difficult. It's very difficult uh, to get. Uh, there's some. Um, so basically, the way. Um, uh, well, we do. One thing that I didn't mention is that uh, we, we started really um, the paper by by looking at case historical case studies of different companies, and that's how we we got to find out. Um, those stories about who the shareholders were. So if you look at different, so you look at different industries, banking, uh, railroads, insurance companies. There are lots of stories in the paper about individual companies, and those the, those um, company histories are are the ones that gave us uh, those data. It's very hard to get aggregate data. Some he'll he'll try to do that uh, with respect. So so you could um, uh, get in some cases some proxies. Uh, based on where the shareholders lived. But it's very hard from the corporate documents themselves, unless you do a very specific one company study to find out exactly who, who the shareholders who the shareholders were. Uh, we did, um, w but, but, but eventually, we did look, we did look at the, in terms of more data, we did look uh, at the charters of, um, of basically, well, we, we got access to a data set covering uh, a really almost a universe of firms formed in the U.S. up to 1860. Those were like 22,000 corporations. There were some problems with the data set. We reduced to six. Um, uh, we, 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 ha we had the number uh, down to 6,000 corporations. And we have some regressions showing the industry variation 
which is uh, which is generally supportive of our of our view. But it, it's really hard. I would absolutely love. Um, to get this information. There was a problem in Brazil too. I, in Brazil I had access to lots of historical records, but I could see the names of the shareholders and uh, at most where they lived, but it's, it was very hard to know what their, what their interest was in the firm otherwise. Um, one point that's interesting is that, that most of these firms did not have a great ownership concentration. And it's interesting because Mosacchio used the low level of ownership concentration, which for some parts of the literature is associated with good investor protection. The law and finance literature says, well, investor protection uh, leads to, to, to ownership dispersion. And then he concluded it was investor protection. But of course, that's very hard because once you have a voting cap in place, it, it, you don't have a, such a, one, a great interest in becoming uh, a shareholder in the firms because, you, because you have a great stake and you won't uh, control the firm. So the bottom line is this is, uh, you know, the multi-million dollar question, but it's very hard to get at uh, aggregate data in, in a significant number of companies in this regard. But we do have anecdotes about uh, cases in which there was an investor from out of town that offered to finance a given railroad, but people turned him down because they were concerned exactly about ha they, they thought that having an investor from, from an out of state would defeat the purposes of the road, which was presumably to provide services to these um, uh, merchants and landowners at, at low cost. Thank you.